A monad is a well-known concept in functional programming languages like Haskell. But what is it? Well, it's a monoid in the category of endofunctors that respects certain rules and has operations to chain computations together. This may sound like incomprehensible blabbering to you, but my goal is that by the end of this video, you know exactly what it means. I think it's important that we as programmers sometimes dive into the theory behind programming. It helps us gain a broader understanding of why things are as they are. It also helps us impress our loved ones at social events, assuming they're interested in category theory. This video has been on my list for a very long time. It's sort of become my nemesis. When I look online for explanations about what a monad actually is, it's often way too theoretical, using terms that are hard to understand for the average programmer, and without really diving into why this concept is useful. Today we're going to explore what exactly is a monad, and we're going to find out if monads are useful at all beyond functional languages like Haskell. Be warned though, I'm going to dive in pretty deep in this video. If you feel like it's going a bit too far, take a break and join my free Discord server at discord.rn.co. It's a really nice, helpful community. Now, if you're ready, let's dive into the rabbit hole. A monad is one of the few design patterns in functional programming. Like I said in the beginning, a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What does that mean? Well, let's start at the end with the word endofunctor. And for that, I'm first gonna look at the last part of that, which is functor. So what is a functor? A functor is a combination of two things. It's an object, a value, combined with a mechanism to do something with that value. Now, that all sounds rather abstract, but if you take a look at this class that I've written right here, this is an example of a functor. It has a value, which gets set in the initializer, and it has a mechanism to do something with that value, namely applying some sort of function to the value. So you see that's happening here in the body of this method called map. We're calling this function, we're providing it the value, that's the mechanism of doing something with the value, and then map returns another functor. So these are the parts that defines what a functor is. It encapsulates a value, it provides a mechanism for doing something with that value, in this case, applying a function. And after doing that, it returns a new functor containing that process, that changed value. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. And map is a pretty common name for that. An endo functor is a specific version of a functor that does exactly the same thing, except that when it returns a functor, it returns something that has the same shape as the original functor that the method was called on. And by shape, I mean that it's the same combination of the two things. It's the value plus the same method for applying an operation to the value. And in this case, the functor class is actually an example of an endo functor because it returns a functor which has the same shape as the original functor, even though the value is different. So it's really about the structure. It's not about the value, not even the type. If you have a function that takes a value, let's say of type integer and turns it into a string, then functor is still an endo functor because it returns something that has the same shape. It has a value. We don't care about the structure of the value. We care about that it is a value and it has the same method for doing something with that value, for modifying, for processing that value. So that's what an endo functor is. Here we have an example of a class that's not an endo functor. So this is class string functor. It gets a value, stores that value, and then it has a map method, just like the original functor that I showed you. Also gets a function. But here, this doesn't return a string functor. It returns a list functor, which is another type of functor that gets a value that's stored in a list. So in this case, what we're doing is that we're changing the functor that it returns. It's not the same thing. So string functor, because it returns a list functor and not a string functor, is not an endo functor. It's a regular functor. If we go back to the original functor class that I showed you, I've also added an example here. So we start with a functor containing the value five. And then if I do map add one, so the add one function gets an integer and returns an integer, and then I map that onto this particular functor, then G, 
the result of that map function is also a functor instance. That's because map returns a functor. So the functor returns another instance of the functor. The second thing is that it preserves the structure. So G is an instance of functor. Structure is the same. Final rule of something being an endo functor is that there is composition. So if we map add one and then we map multiplied by two and we take a look at the value, then that's the same as mapping simply applying these two functions in sequence directly. And if we get the value that way, it's also exactly the same. So composing various maps in sequence is the same as simply applying the function. That's the rule of composition. So to recap, a monad is a specific type of endo functor. It encapsulates a value, it provides a mechanism for doing something with that value, and that mechanism maps back to the same category. So you start with a functor, you start with a monad, and you get another monad back as a result. It also preserves the structure, so you get the same monad back, and it preserves composition. So instead of mapping two things in sequence, you can also simply call those two things immediately, and then the result is going to be the same. So the monad, monadness doesn't change composition. Another aspect of the monad is that it's also a monoid. So what is a monoid? Well, it's a set of elements with a binary operation. So you combine two elements that produces a third. It should be associative. So the order in which you do the binary operation shouldn't matter. And there should be an identity element. You could, should be able to pick one of the two elements as a particular value, and then it should result in the same element. If you take a look at this function, for example, that's of course a very basic function, but this is actually a monoid because it has, it's a binary operation. So it takes two elements, returns a third, which is the sum of X and Y. It's also associative because it doesn't matter if we do X plus Y or Y plus X. And there's also a unit element zero, because we, if, if we add zero to X, then we get X. So this is a monoid and a monad is a monoid in the domain of endo functors. So monad is an endo functor, so it encapsulates a value. It provides a method for doing some computation on that value. And when it runs that computation, it returns another monad that has exactly the same structure. But because it's a monoid, it also has these two aspects of having a unit type operation and being associative. So here's an example of a monad, which is only slightly different from the functor example that we've seen before. So I have an initializer that gets a value. I have a map method. In this case, I'm calling that bind. And this simply applies a function to a value, but instead of turning the result of the function here into a monad, like what I did here, I turned it into a functor. So I'm not doing that here. Actually here, I'm expecting that the function is going to provide a monad already as a result. And then bind simply calls the function and then returns the result. We also have a unit mechanism. So we can take any value and we can turn it into a monad. Well, simply by calling the initializer. You could even remove the static method because it's already there in the initializer. Now I did one thing here, which is that I use generics so that if I have a monad like this, I can basically use it for any type that I like. So I, I define two type vars, T and U. Monad is a generic that relies on a type T and that's an initialize. So we get a value of a type T. And then we have the bind method, which has a function that expects a value of T and that then returns a monad of type U. So this also shows that this function doesn't necessarily have to return something that has the same value type. It can be a different type. And then finally, the unit static method takes any value and turns it into a monad. And now we have a monad. And since a monad is a monoid, it has to adhere to these rules of, on the one hand, identity. So this should be a unit or initializer method. That's what you see here. But also the associativity. So we should be able to bind functions in sequence, and that should give us the same result as applying those functions directly. So here I have a main function showing again how this works. So I've created now a monad with a value five. And then first I check for the identity. So you can do that on the left side and on the right side. So in this case, I'm binding the monad with a function 
that turns add one of x into a monad. And the value is, of that is exactly the same as simply calling the function with a value five. So that's the identity part. Write identity is the other way around. So if I do bind on the unit and then take the value from that, that should be the same as the monad value itself. So this checks for the identity. The second part is associativity. So I should be able to bind f, then bind g, and that should be the same as binding a function that binds the function and then binds g. It's all a bit complicated, and here you can see I added the assert to check this, but it looks a bit complicated because, of course, there's a bunch of lambda functions and monads, but when I run this, you see that actually the values in the end are the same. So it doesn't output anything. In other words, these asserts, they pass. So again, this all looks a bit complicated, but the whole idea is that a monad is a combination of a value that's encapsulated, plus a mechanism to changing the value, and it has certain properties. So when you do that processing on the value, you get back another monad of the same structure. And if you do multiple of these operations in sequence using the monad bind method, then that's the same as applying those operations directly on the value without using the monads. That's the associativity rule. And why is this important and useful? Well, because of all those rules surrounding monads, it means that you now can encapsulate side effects in a monad object, because we know that the structure stays the same. We know that we're not changing the way that the order of applying operations changes. So that means that we can capture side effects in the monad object, in the value that is part of the monad object. And that's the whole idea of a monad. By the way, if you like diving into more advanced features like decorators, context managers, other advanced features of Python, you might enjoy my next level Python course. To learn more about that, check the website below. Now we've seen a basic example of what a monad is. Why should we use that? What is that useful for? Well, a pretty common monad that you may encounter is the maybe monad. And the maybe monad is a variety of this very generic monad that I showed you just now. The specific thing that it does is that you can provide an optional value. So value can be none. And then the bind method, it has a function that takes a value of that type t, returns another monad, right? But then what it does is that it returns the monad if the value is none, Otherwise, it simply applies the function to the value, like with the original monad. So instead of the simple monad I had here, which just always applies the function, the maybe monad only does that if the value is not none. And that's actually quite useful because that allows us to make sure we only apply an operation to a value if the value actually is valid, is not none. So here's an example of how you could use the maybe monad. So I have a safe divide function that divides x by y, and that returns a maybe monad of type float. So what it does is if y equals zero, we can't divide by zero, obviously. So then we return maybe none. Else we return x divided by y as regular. And then what we can do is use the bind function to do safe divisions in sequence. So here is a result. Here's an example. I start with 10. Then I divide by zero, which is not allowed, right? So that should return none, and then I divide by two. When I run this, you see that the result is none. We don't get an exception or something like that. And that's because the maybe monad takes care of routing us to the non part of the monad whenever we are not able to divide by zero. So here, because I'm not able to divide by zero, that results in maybe none. And then this bind method call simply returns self and doesn't do the second function call. So it doesn't run this function actually, which is nice because now we will only run this function if the previous step was successful. So if I change this into a two and then I run the code again, you see we get 2.5. So we have 10 divided by two divided by two. And I can also turn this into a zero and then you'll see we'll also get none as a result because the second division wasn't possible. So that's the whole idea of the maybe monad. And this type of programming where we have these two options, we have the one path and we have the path where we're still dealing with a valid value is also called railroad oriented programming because we have these two tracks that our program is running on. In that sense, it's an alternative to the regular exception handling of Python, which works differently, right? With exception handling, well, we have our program. And then if there is an exception, there's a separate piece of control logic that you deal with, which is the exception handling part of your program. 
With monads, with the maybe monad, you have two paths, the non-path and the valid path. So it's a different approach to handling errors. And to show you how this all combines, so here I have another example, which is again the maybe monad, but I did things a bit differently. So I now used pattern matching, which is a new feature, relatively new feature in Python that allows me to do match case statements. In order to support this, I needed to extend the class a bit so that I tell the maybe monad that it should match arguments on the value. So that's what it should check. And then I also have a match donder method that compares the two values of these two monads, the two maybe monads. Then in this example, I have a function that parses an integer. So we get a string value and it returns a maybe monad containing an integer. So if we can turn it into an integer, then we simply return that. If there's a value error, we return maybe none. So this translates the Python exception model into a monadic error handling model. And then I have a few other functions. So one checks whether the value is positive and here's another function that simply doubles the value. So then what we can do is again, use the bind method in sequence. So we have some input string and then we bind the various methods that we call in it. And since double doesn't return a maybe monad, it simply returns an integer. I have to turn it into a function that returns maybe monad. So that's why the lambda function is here. And then when we have the main function, so I have my example inputs five minus three foo. So of course only this one should actually end up with a valid value because here the value is not positive. So this is going to put us onto the non path and here foo is not an integer at all. So we should already go on the non path here. And then because I added support for pattern matching to the maybe monad, I can now call this function on each input and then match the result and handle the different cases. So in case of maybe none, I say that it's invalid input. In case the value is an integer, I give this as a result. And in all the other cases, I simply provide a default handling. So if I run this, then this is what we get. If we process five, the result is 10. If we process minus three, we get an invalid input minus three. If we process foo, we also get invalid input. So the real world programming here works. We don't get an exception because that's transformed into a monad. That's actually uh, what happens here in parse int. And we either stay on the valid value path or we go to the non path. So this is how that works. A final thing you could do to make this a bit nicer is to create a decorator. So here I have a function called maybe that contains a wrapper function and then returns that wrapper as a result. This is a standard way in Python of setting up a decorator. And then it already contains the part that turns exceptions into the maybe monad. Now, normally you shouldn't accept for the general exception type. You should always handle specific exceptions, but because here we're patching into the exception handling mechanism and we want to change how it works, I think it's allowed to do that. So what you see is we have a try. So we return maybe and call the function. And if there is an exception, then we return maybe none. So this does two things. It turns a regular function into a monadic function, a function that returns a maybe monad. And it also transforms any exceptions into maybe none. So that's really helpful. So if you have here, for example, the parse int value, so it returns a maybe int, we can now simply do it like this, have it return an int, and then we can throw away all of this code that we had here and use the maybe decorator. And now parse int is a monadic function. And I did the same thing with the double functions. So now if we run this version of the code, we're going to get exactly the same result. But we really simplified things a lot by having this maybe decorator. So we can use our existing functions and simply turning into something that returns a maybe monad. All right, I feel like we've nerded out enough. Now, the question is, does this mean that we should now switch over completely to using monads in Python? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, monads are typically integrated, directly integrated into the syntax of a language. You shouldn't have to be building this kind of boilerplate code. Um, a great example of this is the Rust programming language. Actually, it has a maybe style monad, but it's called result. So Rust has this built in. Now, Python doesn't have syntax like this for monads. We have to build it ourselves. Although there are libraries like the returns library that offers maybe monad and you can use 
pattern matching to select which version of the track you're on. But especially if you're using a bunch of existing libraries, it's a bit of a pain to have to turn everything into a monad so that you're doing error handling the monadic way. So my conclusion is that at this moment in Python, it's not really a good idea to do this. But I do think it's good to know this type of programming exists especially if you plan to work with languages like Rust in the future. But I'd like to know what you think. Would you use a maybe monad in your Python code to handle errors? Or do you prefer to stick with exceptions? Do you see other ways in which monads could help you write better Python code? Let me know in the comments. So I hope you enjoyed this video and gave you a better understanding of what a monad is so that if you're at a party and a family member asks you, hey, do you know what a monad is? You say, it's a monoid in a category of endofunctors, and you actually know what you're saying. Now, there's lots of other aspects of functional programming that are interesting, especially if you look closer at the Functools package in Python. And I did a video covering the Functools package specifically. So if you like that kind of thing, you should definitely watch this video next. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.